This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. More and more, people are depending on the Internet for their daily news updates. But there is no overall web editor to do a reality check on content. So finding out what is factual is an ever-increasing challenge. Today, in this Earth Files podcast, I would like to set the record straight on a headline that has been circulated on the web for weeks and is false, according to astronomers, and to report facts about in July of a chupacabras in Texas that is not a chupacabras, but is definitely a strange animal. Let's begin with the astronomy story that is not true. The headline states, quote, Scientists now know we're not from here, exclamation point. The author is listed as Dan Eden of Viewzone.com. Mr. Eden begins, quote, Imagine the shock of growing up in a loving family with people you call mom and dad, and then suddenly learning that you are actually adopted. The same sense of shock came as scientists announced that the sun, the moon, our planet, and its siblings were not born into the familiar band of stars known as the Milky Way galaxy, but we actually belong to a strange formation with the unfamiliar name the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, unquote. The article references two astrophysicists at the University of Virginia who used infrared maps of our galaxy to confirm that the reason the Milky Way goes at an angle across the Earth's night skies is because our solar system does not actually belong to the Milky Way. According to Dan Eden, the University of Virginia astrophysicists have confirmed that we actually belong to the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Well, I called the University of Virginia Astronomy Department and talked with Professor Stephen Majewski, lead author of a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal entitled New Map of the Milky Way Shows Our Galaxy to Be a Cannibal. The date of that paper? December 20th, 2003, four years ago. That Astrophysical Journal article was about how the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is 10,000 times smaller than the mass of our Milky Way and is being absorbed by the Milky Way, a common process in this universe where larger galaxies eat smaller ones and grow larger. Professor Majewski and his colleague, Professor Michael Skretsky, explained that our solar system and Milky Way only briefly and periodically pass through Sagittarius debris. And one of those times happens to be now. Quote, Remarkably, stars from Sagittarius are now raining down onto our present position in the Milky Way. Stars from an alien galaxy are relatively near us, unquote. Nowhere in the Astrophysical Journal article do the scientists suggest that our solar system is from the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. Further, astrophysicists know that solar systems have evolved at many different angles to the Milky Way galactic plane. Bottom line, a 2003 Science Journal article gets resurrected four years later in 2007 with the sensational claim that our solar system is not really from the Milky Way, while in fact the original science was about how the Milky Way that includes our solar system is big enough to eat other smaller galaxies. Big things in this universe eating smaller things is an ancient observation, from galaxies to chickens eating earthworms. One longtime predator of chickens has been foxes and coyotes. But beginning back in 1995, farmers in the El Yunque rainforest region of Puerto Rico reported finding chickens, rabbits, goats, sheep, and even dogs with quarter-inch-wide puncture holes that did not bleed, but usually left the domestic animals dead as if the blood had been sucked out of them. That description led to the name chupacabras, which means goat sucker in Spanish. The descriptions were of a gray-colored creature whose skin had spots and little hair. 
Some eyewitnesses said the creature could walk on its hind legs, standing about five feet tall, and then go down on all fours and run rapidly, even jumping six-foot-high fences. The chupacabra's attacks expanded from Puerto Rico to the southern United States and Mexico in 1996. Then that May, two men and a woman in different Mexico locations were attacked by something that they said felt like plastic and left bloodless puncture marks in their human arms. After that, the chupacabra's phenomenon seemed to stop suddenly by June of 1996. Then seven years later, in 2003, more strange unidentified animals were reported and photographed in Maryland after more puncture wound attacks on domestic animals. The next year, in May 2004, in Elmendorf, Texas, not far from San Antonio, another gray unidentified creature was shot and photographed, but no forensic testing was done. Five months after that, in October 2004, another nearly identical gray creature was also shot in Pollock, Texas, north of Galveston. And now, on Saturday, July 14, 2007, five miles south of Cuero, Texas, which is an hour south of San Antonio, two similar strange gray animals were found again, this time apparently hit by cars. One of those two was in front of the Seven Sea Ranch, owned by Phyllis and Steve Carrion, who have ranched in Cuero since 2002. Phyllis also is a board-certified nutritional consultant and owns the Seven Sea Sports Clothing Shop in Cuero. The roadkill of what she calls, quote, a bizarre creature with short front legs and long back legs, came as an answer to what had been killing her chickens and probably causing her kittens to disappear over the past couple of years. A lot of people have thought that I've just seen this thing within the last month or couple of weeks, but I have been trying to capture this creature for about the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. My sister first saw it about two and a half years ago at our ranch. We were in Africa, and she had come to check on our place, and when she was leaving, she saw this really strange creature. Well, when we got back from Africa, I'm driving in our pasture, and I happen to look over, and I see this bizarre-looking creature running through the pasture. And what caught my attention on it was its gallop. It looked as if its front legs had been dismembered, broken. There was something about it that the front end of the animal was much lower than the back end. And as I watched it, it ran behind a barn that we have on our ranch, ran into an opening, just stopped and looked at me. And at that time, I got a better view of it and could see that it appeared to be a hairless type of creature that had a very big snout with very large ears, two very large teeth from the top coming down, two very big teeth from the bottom coming up, both outside of the jaw and the, the gum line so that you could actually were visible. And he darted off. That was my first exposure to it. Well, of course, I called my sister and told her, and she's like, that's exactly what I had seen on your place. So I began losing kittens. We were trying to get some kittens at, this, at our ranch house and to try and keep the snakes away. And every time I would get kittens and actually keep them, put them outside, they would vanish. So I started videoing in their yard to see what was coming up. Well, I never could get anything, so I kept losing kittens. I had gone through eight kittens, and this is over about a year and a half period. So finally I decided to get some chickens. I had chickens set, and actually on video I caught bobcats coming up to take the chicken, and I got wild dogs coming up to take the chicken. But what was the most unusual is that it appeared when my videotape would run out, Something would come up, kill the chicken, suck the blood out of it, and leave the chicken lay. So I have been very passionate at trying to find this animal, getting it on video, trying to capture it, at some point trying to get it so that we could find out what it was. After going through about 28 chickens, 
and still it was be very, very elusive. I had almost given up on it because it had actually been about eight months that I had not had any sighting of it. Now, what has been unusual is that when my husband would come back in from overseas and spend 30 days at home, he would be on the ranch all day long, every day, and never saw it. So the family really began teasing me, going, oh, my gosh, it's this chupacabra that you're seeing, and it's this mythical creature. And and I'm like, well, whatever you call it, it is very, very ugly. I started looking at some stories that were on our San Antonio news of people actually finding these chupacabras. The biggest problem appeared, though, is no one ever had one that could be tested. So I always said, if I ever have a chance to get one, I'm getting it because I want to find out what it is. If it's killing my chickens and possibly taking my kittens, it is doing something else to some other animals. Lo and behold... A neighbor behind me who had just recently been into my store to say that he had seen this creature running in and out of our pasture called me and said, you are not going to believe this, but someone has hit one, and I have it, and I want you to come look at it Hmm. and tell me if it's what you've been seeing. So, of course, I jump in my truck and run over to his ranch, and it's exactly it. I said, that is exactly what I have seen. It was much smaller But I said, it's the same thing. No hair, the big teeth, short front legs, the bigger back legs, the whole scenario fit. While I was talking to him, someone called me and said one had been hit in front of my ranch. So I get in my vehicle, drive back to our ranch again. Lo and behold, there is this one that I am not believing because it's like this has got to be the one that I was seeing. Right. It was a much larger animal than the first one in that the first one I'm going to say probably weighed about 20 pounds. Um, this one ranged more in the 35 pounds. So I picked it up and I brought it back to my house and started taking pictures of it and ended up skinning it, most of it out and saving the head and the front part of the body so that I, at some point, could find someone that would be interested enough to help me try and figure out what this is. I contacted one of my friends who was a veterinarian in Victoria. I had him look at it, and the more we started to examine the animal, we definitely came to the conclusion this was a very strange creature. The short front legs, the paws had a very big pad on the front legs. The back legs appeared to be much longer and had no pads on them at all compared to the front. Hmm. It had a very long snout with what we said was a slight overbite on the top. What we found so unusual is that when we lifted the gums up, in between the two big teeth that stuck out over the bottom jaw, there was no teeth at all in that space nor was there any indication that there have been teeth that were ground down. It was pure gum. On the bottom, where the teeth come up, we found the exact same scenario. It was just gum. The overbite teeth and the two teeth from the bottom up may be what is being used to puncture and suck the blood. Possibly. That is correct. Now, I lived in Africa for five years, and I have been back to Africa three times, and we have hunted in Africa. So I have seen a lot of African animals and some very weird ones. Never have I seen one like this. When we looked at the pictures and when we sent pictures off to the Texas Department, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, their reaction was, oh, this is a mangy coyote, which frustrated me because we're like, no, this is not a mangy coyote. What the veterinarian, Dr. Travis Shaw, and I also thought was unusual was that when animals are killed or die, their eyes, for the most part, are open. When the biologist first looked at this at Texas Parks and Wildlife and the veterinarian, they're like, well, why did you close the eyes on it, Phyllis? And I'm, I didn't. They were closed when I first got to the animal because I did an examination of everything before I even touched the animal while it was still sitting in the road after mm-hmm. a vehicle had hit it. So we kind of thought that was bizarre. Now, I had a friend of mine who practices in a town near here who is a physician. She came by and looked at it yesterday with me, 
And the more we just look at this thing, the more we find things just truly bizarre. Uh, the iris of the eye appears to be blue, which, talking to some biologists, and you could probably confirm this, it is not unusual that a wolf would have a blue eye. Mm-hmm. So we're wondering if it is not some type of a cross between possibly a wild dog, possibly a wolf, maybe a coyote, but the short legs in the front has us baffled. Yeah. Because it's like, what could that be a cross of? Why did you not take that whole fresh animal to a veterinarian pathologist? Uh, There are none in our area. And what has been extremely disheartening to me was that when we contacted the Texas Parks and Wildlife, we had a game warden come by my shop and he looked at the pictures. And his comment was, yeah, well, I'll take them to Austin and we'll see. Well, he went to Austin and he called me from Austin and said, yeah, they're just saying it's kind of a wild dog or something like that and discredited the rest of the story. Hmm. They never even offered to come look at what I had to even show any interest in it, which has disappointed me. And there was an article in our local newspaper today that said that I was basically disappointed that we have not had any more interest in it from our Texas Parks and Wildlife. So maybe perhaps we have this creature here that is a mutation or a different breed of something that maybe it is the chupacabra. (laughs) What is left of the animal that you have in your possession now? What I have right now is the hide from about the mid-back all the way, including the head, and down the legs. So I have the front half of the creature, and of course, to be honest with you, what my ultimate goal would be with this is that I would love to mount it with a chicken in its mouth and hang it up in our game room. (laughs) Because while we have a lot of, uh, we've been all over the world hunting, we've got some very unusual mounts. This one, we feel hands down, would probably draw the most attention. (laughs) I, I think I would agree, and I'm curious what happened to the organs and the skeleton. Uh, I have all of the bones. I laid it out in the pasture. And it's funny, a lot of people said to me, Phyllis, why didn't you cut the stomach open and look? And I'm like, it it, it just goes back to my days in Africa and when we hunted in Africa. That's one of the things that the Africans do for those that are listening to this. If they've hunted there, they will note that you skin the complete animal without ever opening it up because they don't want to have any demons. It's just an African belief, I think. Hmm. And when I was looking at it, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to do anything to this animal other than take what I think we need off of it Mm -hmm. to help me identify something. The organs and that carcass, what happened to it? Uh, They just were eaten up in the the pasture, basically. Okay, so you just left it out there. Yes, I did. after I finished everything and I took off the front part of it and all of that, yes, I laid it out in the pasture. Okay. What I found was very unusual that it took three days for any buzzards to even come near it. Now in early August, Phyllis Canyon says she would like to have DNA sequencing of a tooth and hide from the animal that she has partially preserved at her Quero Ranch to find out once and for all, is this a hairless coyote? infected by severe mange, overbite, and short front legs? Or is this a new animal species? Or a strange hybrid combination? Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. Earth Files.